This is Dr. Anthony Chang, and I'm visiting London, so I thought it'd be appropriate to call this update or tea with um, <laughs> Dr. AI. And I want to thank Charlie for setting this up. We're in the midst of the World Cup. I was uh, sharing the World Cup experience with my London friends and colleagues yet last yesterday. And uh, as you may or may not know, there have been a flurry of activity um, of machine learning trying to predict the World Cup winner. And um, despite some pretty fancy maneuvering with machine learning and random forest, that um, and over 100,000 simulations of games, uh, we're still not able to predict uh, the correct winner. So I think, um, um, as you know, the random forest is a way to correct for overfitting, which is a common problem, as you know, with uh, decision trees in general. So you may be curious to know that the three teams that were predicted to win the World Cup are actually all out of the World Cup already. And those those teams are Brazil, Germany, and Spain. So my, my only um, comment here is I think there are some interesting implications for AI and biomedicine being um, that biomedicine, just like the World Cup, that's uh, involving human beings are not always as easily to predict as you might think. So there's a lot of news on the layoffs at Watson Health, um, indicating there's some major issues, um, particularly with comments from engineers that have left IBM Watson, and I have quite a few contacts. I think perhaps it's a little bit um, a reach when the IBM Watson CEO is promising that AI can improve businesses on an exponential scale. And I think, uh, as you may or may not know, IBM has invested heavily in Watson, about $15 billion in the last five years. And there's some, been some issues with um, integrating Watson into workflow, which as, as you know, historically, um, AI projects and biomedicine have failed because it simply did not take into the um, physician and nurse's workflow into account enough and um, the other issue has been claims of um, mismanagement or the term when IBM Watson comes in and man nano manages is called blue washing. So I think uh, perhaps there's some lessons there. As one IBM, ex IBM engineer said it, I think in regards to the cognitive computing platform, um, he said it's like having great shoes but not knowing how to walk, which I think Similar comments have been said about um, other big projects as well. So I think lesson here is that one, you need to integrate with healthcare workers' workflow. And secondly, I think it's also defining the problems clearly before you impose a technological solution. Okay, so another uh, interesting piece of news, I, I'm traveling to China quite a bit. Um, nowadays to look at the AI landscape uh, in medicine in China. And one recent significant event is something called BioMind, which is the uh, neuroimaging software that's AI driven. And uh, there was a recent uh, almost game show um, competition between the BioMind AI doctor and human beings. And it turned out that the human radiologist as a group had a 63, 66% um, ROC accuracy. And compared to the AI BioMind radiologic interpretation software. So um, BioMind is a collaboration between Analytics of Singapore and Tian Hospital in China as part of the Chinese government um, AI push in their um, plan. And I think China particularly is interesting in terms of AI and biomedicine because of two major things. I think one is the tremendously high volume of patients that they have in any disease category. And secondly, because of the 
re relatively open access to medical data. And I think one thing I learned about China is um, the recent increase in AI investment is really um, leading to a lot of startups in China with AI and healthcare. Um, Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba, all these big um, giants in technology are investing as well as um, nurturing AI startups and also uh, even have startups of their own. So that's something that um, I think we can really learn from is how they're executing as well as thinking of AI solutions to healthcare. The graphic of the month, uh, we want to look at some of the top startups uh, in the AI space. And these are some of the AI startups in healthcare that's getting attention. Alive Core is an EKG um, software with interpretation. Bay Labs look at echocardiographic images. Crosschecks is a company that's in a very interesting space called Robotic Process Automation, or RPA, and that looks at easy algorithm-driven solutions to healthcare problems. Prognos deals with, as the name implies, uh, some aspect of precision medicine. And lastly, Sensely um, works with educational avatars as well as AI-inspired solutions to communication. And these are all companies that are uh, in different uh, interesting um, AI spaces in healthcare. The cartoon of the month, just for a little um, humor, the radiologist saying, everything looks good on your MRI, really good. And the patient saying, is he second screening my screening? So just a little humor on AI-inspired um, um, jokes. I um, want to pay a special tribute to those of you who may know Anthony Bourdain. I had the pleasure of meeting him this this year, and um, and I think has a lot of relevance to AI and healthcare. Um, he's saying maybe that's enlightenment enough to know that there is no final resting place of the mind, no moment of smug clarity, and I think that applies to all of us. Um, perhaps wisdom is realizing how small I am how and unwise and how far I have yet to go. And I think um, that's a really healthy attitude for uh, learning and teaching about AI and healthcare. Just wanna also um, give a shout out to my new colleagues and friends at uh, AME, which is a publishing company that is working hard on publishing the first uh, clinician focused Artificial Intelligence in Medicine a journal called the Journal of Medical Artificial Intelligence. And I'm privileged to be on the editorial board and would encourage those of you, particularly who are clinicians, to collaborate with data scientists or uh, and or um, be a principal investigator and turn in um, manuscripts for this new journal. And I'll have more information in the ensuing months. And also a special tribute to Dr. Annette Tenteji, who I'll be seeing in Stockholm um, tomorrow. She's an associate professor of computer engineering in Amsterdam. And her areas of interest in the biomedical space includes approximate reasoning and medical knowledge acquisition. So these are really important disciplines in biomedicine. And she was, um, our faculty at last year's AI Med meeting in California, and was really an amazing um, speaker as well as contributor to the meeting. I want to give her a special um, tribute because of the work that she's put in the last few months, particularly in trying to have clinicians like myself um, bridge with the machine learning and data scientist domain crowd in um, particularly Europe. So um, part of the reason I'm gonna be in Stockholm is to um, give a talk on the clinician perspective of ethics of AI in medicine. So special thanks to Annette for um, her uh, in, uh, key role in forming an alliance between uh, clinicians and data scientists.
want to also um, talk about the company of the month. And we want to give tribute to um, Babylon Health, which is based in the UK. And it's a special chat bot that is designed to answer healthcare questions. And as a matter of fact, the chat bot from Babylon apparently um, had better score on the Royal College of Physicians examination than the physicians themselves. So um, take it for what it's worth. And I think their mission is to democratize healthcare. So it's not only available for perhaps uh, economically challenged families in any country, but also third and fourth world countries as well. So I want to pay a special tribute to Babylon Health. I suppose now is a maybe just to kick off a question session. Uh, one of the questions that, that springs to mind for me from listening to some of the some of the discussions is in, in some of our recent work at AI Med, we've had a lot of clinicians expressing, especially with our medical imaging issue, fears of a, being re replaced by AI. And one of the articles you recently wrote was about a human um, and machine intelligence, mm -hmm. not versus. Uh, would you be interested in explaining that concept and, and why that's an important thing in the conversation around AI? Sure, Charlie. I think um, one very common um, concern, I think, uh, asked of me, of, especially from medical image intensive fields like radiology, pathology, dermatology, ophthalmology, and also my field of cardiology, um, they're concerned that perhaps computer vision with machine learning and deep learning will be faster and better to, to the point where um, the images will be interpreted without them. And my answer is always that I think um, for the next um, few years, as well as into the future, I don't see computer vision alone interpreting the images because there's so many extra layers that you need uh, in addition to interpretation, like the patient's history and the context and the fact that um, the volume of imaging is escalating at a very uh, fast pace, even exponential scale. And also I think people still want a human um, physician involved interpretation of any study, which is um, about 90% of the crowd that we've surveyed. So I think um, rather than being intimidated by recent technological advances in artificial intelligence, I think it makes sense, more sense, I think, for the subspecialists to find ways to collaborate and work with the artificial intelligence technology and um, I think that's going to be the best possible situation for um, patients in general. Okay, so we talked about Babylon Health and um, the chatbot um, proving to be superior to, uh, in, in terms of test results, uh, to um, the Royal College physician. So sorry about that, Charlie. But um, I think, however, can a chatbot really empathize or sympathize with the patient's troubles. I think that's something to think about. Um, I think it'll be a while before human beings are entirely comfortable with uh, a chatbot or a robot um, delivering, I think, empathy and um, feeling good about that. So it's been quite controversial in some ways that the um... The, Bab the company Babylon, because there's well, some of the, um, the groups in the UK National Health Service have blocked deployment. That's right. Yeah. Right. What do you think about that? Do you think that's the classic well, case of in traditional institutions? Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think there's some traditional institutions, as well as academic centers, are still not sure about the exact role of a chatbot or or robot for that matter, or any type of artificial intelligence. Uh, and until they're sure, they're just not willing to take a leap of faith into a futuristic solution to a health problem. But I think, again, rather than be intimidated by the technology, let's try to understand it together and work together on improving the technology. 
I think since um, perhaps I'm a little bit biased because I'm in London this this week, um, the organization of the month, I like to pay tribute to the Allen Turing Institute, which um, was formed recently to serve as a national institute for data science and artificial intelligence. And it's actually based inside the British Library. And it's also involving a coalition of universities to form a, a collaborative hub to advance research and lead the public conversation on AI. So perhaps uh, I think they will be a formidable voice in terms of um, reassuring uh, the healthcare sector about AI use in healthcare. Some uh, upcoming meetings, I'll be going to Stockholm, Sweden tonight to join a um, workshop on AI in health, and that's going to be in Sweden. I'm also encouraged to see the beginning of NIH workshops on use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to advance biomedical research. So that's going to be in the summer months. And um, we're also holding a meeting um, prior to the meeting that you see on the slide here. Um, there'll be a couple of days of um, clinician data scientists gathering in Orange County and then going on to a machine learning for healthcare meeting that's mostly attended by data scientists. And that meeting is going to be August 17th and 18th uh, um, at Stanford um, in California. Uh, another upcoming meeting, as I mentioned, is um, trying to gather clinicians with a strong data scientist interest. Um, and that's going to be a summit at August 15th and 16th here in California as well. And uh, for those of you who attended an AI Med meeting in the past, we have, um, instead of our annual meeting in California in December, um, which will still happen December 13th to the 15th. And we had close to 600 attendees last year, as some of you know. Uh, we're also launching AI Med Europe, which will be in London. And that meeting is occurring September 11th to the 13th. And um, also one in China, given the level of interest. We're going to be in Hangzhou November 8th to the 10th of this year as well. So um, we'll have three meetings trying to uh, meet the needs of particularly clinicians, but also other sectors in healthcare wanting to understand and appreciate what AI in healthcare can do. Uh, just an early um, um, preview of a meeting that's coming up in 2019. Um, I'm going to be collaborating with AI in Medicine in Europe. Uh, and giving a talk at um, this meeting. Um, the dates there are from 2017, but the dates are not set for 2019, but the meeting will take place in Poland. That's gonna be in late June and early July. So lastly, um, in case um, you want uh, more reading materials and and watch more videos. There is a treasure trove of um, resources available, including the ebook, um, as well as the third issue of the AI Med magazine that Charlie is an editor of, as well as all the video clips from previous meetings are available on the website www.ai-med.io. And uh, everything is free for you to download and please share with um, your colleagues as well. Do you want to tell us a bit about why the AI Med magazine is a magazine and not another journal? Oh, good question. Well, um, I wanted to um, collaborate on, a, on the magazine, or I call it the academic magazine, because as, you, as some of us know, uh, we're either too busy or becoming less interested in reading articles from a formal academic journal. And um, I think it's not as user-friendly as it maybe perhaps was um, a few decades ago. And at the same time, I didn't want to put out uh, something 
that's more um, congruent with the industry magazine. So I thought a nice sweet spot would be a um, an academic magazine with good academic content, but perhaps uh, visually um, be different than the typical academic journal. So um, like everyone um, on the webinar, as well as um, all of our colleagues and friends who um, email us and contact us and give us feedback, Charlie is the editor, and uh, give us feedback about the um, issues that are um, uploaded so far. Again, the third issue is just literally came out this week. It's going to be each issue will focus on a particular theme. And this issue is focusing on medical imaging. We have upcoming issues in the next few months on precision medicine, as well as virtual and augmented reality. So very, very excited about the upcoming issues uh, with uh, different themes, but we also have regular features that will discuss books and articles that are particularly helpful. Um, if you're interested in reading more um, in this exciting area of artificial intelligence and medicine. Just one thing, I suppose, on the last thing as we talked about so many conferences is you've been attending and hosting conferences for so many years now. What do you think is going to be different for people who come to conferences about artificial intelligence in 2018 versus two years ago or even last year? What's changing? Um, well, I think what's changing for sure is the level of interest, curiosity from the clinicians as a whole. I think even two years ago, it was not uncommon to go to a meeting on artificial intelligence and medicine and perhaps see just a handful of clinicians. And now, um, having said that, um, the vision for AI Med has been trying to drive the clinician's interest. And that's why I think we typically get 30 to 45% of the audience being clinicians. And I think that's relatively uncommon when you go to an AI in medicine or healthcare meeting, it's usually predominantly a non-clinician audience. So we're hoping to change that with AI Med, and we're hoping to also encourage clinicians to just to go to um, meetings that focus on artificial intelligence and how to apply that new technology that is fairly robust now to healthcare medicine. By the way, um, a few of you asked me what are some good books to read? If you're interested in AI and you just want a better background, I think a couple of books recently um, that are particularly good. One is by Andrew McAfee, and we'll send you uh, these links or have information available for you. Uh, one book is Andrew McAfee's book called Machine, uh, Crowd Machine Platform. Um, and that's a particularly good book if you just want to understand the economics of artificial intelligence for the next few decades. And another good book is called Man and Machine. Um, and um, we'll get links to or information to all of you. So we now have a question from HD. He or she says, I am uh, listening from OC and was wondering, is there any forum that the data scientists can interact and collaborate with MDs? Yes, um, if you're, if the OC means Orange County, which is where I'm living, feel free to email me directly and I have um, available data scientists as well as um, uh, clinicians who are interested in data science or can actually do data science that can collaborate with you for sure. So feel free to email me. I will share the, uh, the email address with the, the list of people who signed up to the webinar. You, you'll have that. Yes. Absolutely. And also um, the AI Med um, magazines Issue two and issue three have my book reviews of the two books I mentioned. So uh, if you're looking for the precise title and the authors, it's going to be in the academic magazines as well. So we have a question from um, Sohaib, apologies if that's mispronounced, um, who says, do you, do you recommend an MD to do a data science degree or tech MBA? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a little bit biased because I did both, um, but I do think special uh, effort to um, get educated as well as uh, more importantly than the education is meeting people that 
can be your own personal network in the near future for either data science or an MBA that's focused on technology, I think are gonna be very valuable. So again, I think the education, sometimes you can get um, online with um, certification programs, but I think more important than even perhaps the educational material that you will get from a degree program are the important contacts and friends and colleagues that you'll be making um, during the program. Uh, for my experience um, with the biomedical data science and AI program at Stanford, I still maintain contact and very active in um, uh, keeping up with my former professors and colleagues in my class um, to this day. You notice that a fair number of my uh, invited faculty from um, for AI Med are actually uh, either, either having been to Stanford or still at Stanford. So I think um, the wealth of experience you get outside the classroom in making new colleague and colleagues and friends, as well as just having important contacts, I think perhaps is the more valuable aspect of those um, degrees that you get in the classroom. And that's a very personal um, perspective. I think we, we may have time for one more question if someone um, is going for it. So, um, we'll Charlie, just... perhaps we'll let, um, is there a chatbot out there that wants to ask a question? <laughs> well, I don't know. If the humans are shy, maybe the chatbot won't be as shy. We'll have to do that the next time. We'll see if I can find it. So, so Habers asked another question and said, do you think Amazon and Apple will look to hire doctors who are also data scientists for innovation purposes? Um, they already are. <laughs> so um, I think if you add a data science background or a tech MBA background to your resume of education as well as experiences, you go way to the head of the class in terms of people that they're interested in. Um, we should also um, obviously remember other big giants like Google, NVIDIA, and all these companies are looking for not just data scientists, but also um, data scientists with either a strong clinical background or for them, uh, especially with projects in healthcare, they particularly like clinicians or even medical school graduates who have a data science or an MBA background. So yes, the answer is uh, definitely you're looking for people. They've hired people. They've hired people I know. I've been approached um, by these most of these companies. So it's another way to balance perhaps your clinical career with uh, another either side career or um, changing your career from clinical medicine. So I think now that there is a significant issue universally with physician burnout, I think this is a, a great way to either have um, partial involvement with a big company in the future or even transitioning your career to um, working with a tech giant like the ones you've mentioned. So great question. Uh, and uh, Saeb has followed up to, to, to tell us that um, uh, they are a doctor, an MPH, with a year of business school, as well as part of a clinical entrepreneur program. So between NYU Tech MBA or a data science master, that's what he's trying to decide which one to do. Um, and you said uh, very helpful. Um, and one of the contributors to this issue of the AMED magazine is I believe someone you know, Dr. Chang, uh, Dr. Yes. Dr. Jen Jen Chen, yes. who's recently done a similar, I think she's completed the course at Stanford, data science. Um, I remember in her article, she said that initially it was actually quite difficult to find a job role that was suitable for her talents because, mm -hmm. uh, because of what she was able to do. But yeah. now she's found a job and she said that it's, uh, she's, she feels that you know, she's going to be uh, in a much better position soon. Yes, I think um, that's definitely correct. And I, I'm proud to say that I actually had many conversations with her and trying to gently persuade her to pursue data science. And she ended up graduating uh, out of Berkeley. And I think she was particularly glad that she did this. So I think as we look at clinical medicine and oftentimes a lot of interesting questions posed by each subspecialty are not being answered with um, traditional methodologies and research. If you have a data science background, then you know that there are lots of additional creative ways you can answer those clinical questions. So in other words, traditional research, I think, 
may be partly or entirely replaced by a new way of looking at data with data science and artificial intelligence. Um, I think if that's uh, everything that we have for today, um, I think it's fair to say that we could thank um, everyone for coming and, and follow up afterwards. As I said, I was going to email the list of people who've registered and provide what your, your email address, Dr. Chang, and any sure. other information. You're, so yeah, we'll provide contact details, and if you do think of any questions, um, there's been some excellent questions today, so thank you very much for that. You can follow up and just send them by email. And we can address them uh, with a response by email or in the next um, in the next webinar that we do. We may uh, be able to do it like that. Thank you, everybody, for um, coming on the web webinar, and we'll see you next month.